So the, the arbitrage event is actually something you don't want. That doesn't happen all that often. You will see it move slightly, but it, it really becomes really an event for large players or for something very specific like this weekend. So this weekend is obviously very, very, very rare. It does not happen like that. The biggest aspect of stable coins is to have the ability to move around liquidity, to have the ability to do pricing, to do commerce in these things, to have these things operate more independent of, of each other. So you don't want something on ETH dragging down HEX, right? As long as ETH is functioning, you don't want it pulling down HEX. Uh, so sometimes we get that confused. We're like, oh, these things are in a liquidity pair. They move together. Well, kind of. Depends on the amount of liquidity, right? So if HEX goes up a bunch, it doesn't move ETH because it's such a small percentage of ETH is li overall liquidity. But it can do the inverse where if even if ETH is, say, 10 to 15%, it can still have an effect on HEX's price. So... These things do matter as far as the way liquidity pools function, and you do want functioning stable coins. And there's a lot to dig through this weekend that it'll take time for a lot of people to process. Um, one is most people would have told you that USDC was safer than USDT. That wasn't a bad, that wasn't a bad assumption. They just happened to be wrong, right? So if I tell you that one thing is, hey, there, there's a 3% chance that something happens with USDC and there's a 15% chance that something happens with USDT just because the, the event happens to USDC doesn't mean that we were wrong, right? So every concern that you had about USDT and its lack of transparency when it comes to disclosures on their, their assets and their collateral backing, those are all still true. Just because something interesting happened to USDC doesn't invalidate the thesis on USDT. So again, in, in poker, we call that resulting. If you get two aces and you play the hand and you lose to seven, two doesn't mean that seven, two is a better hand. Like that's the math. It happens that way. That's happenstance. So we want to make sure that there we're, we're careful about what we derive from, from the event. So one is be careful, you know, you know, segregating funds, understanding how FDIC works. We can get into a lot when it comes to the legacy side, but specifically for crypto is don't, don't think that we were wrong, right? Like just, you can have good process and just still end up on the wrong side of a decision. So USDC had a lot of collateral issues. It also recovered. Um, we got to see some interesting things play out with, with DAI, but we still want these things to function. So especially with things that are collateral backed, part of the idea is there's, there's different sides you want to understand on the borrowing side, but the first words basically ever written in crypto was a digital peer to peer cash system. So the idea of these things was commerce, right? So pricing things in other commodities, again, whether or not you think Bitcoin's a currency, it functions and curve looks like a commodity. So that's difficult, right? Like go to the gas station and tell them you want to price everything in BTC when they have a margin that's 10 to 15% and this thing sit here and waves around them, right? So if you take something that can be collateral backed, you give up some capital efficiency, but now I can price something. And, and that's the idea is if you look at LUSD, you know, USD on the future, they're a dollar's worth of value derived from something that we care about that we can guarantee is there. So if you if you operate on Ethereum, you then ETH has value. If you want to use LUSD, it's not a dollar. It's a dollar's measurement worth of ETH, and that's valuable. So rather than having to denominate every single thing in the commodity that moves, we can break it down into dollar-sized bits that we can spend. That's the idea of these things to be used correctly. So I can't, it's very, very hard to price things in ETH, but I can still pay for them with the value derived from ETH using something like LUSD. So when it comes to these things, it's what are you doing, right? So if, if you say, hey, I want to be able to go turn this stuff into my bank account. Okay, well, if you're using Coinbase and you're stuck using them, okay, well, then USDC can make some sense. But realize that there's an exposure, so we don't want to sit in USDC for that long. If you're trying to do peer-to-peer -peer transactions, if you're trying to obfuscate from price, if you're trying to provide liquidity, then things like LUSD can make more sense because you don't have risk to what just happened. You could just hold something that you know that value is more stable and, and move on down the road and perform these other transactions and price things in them. So even, again, even someone who's biased about LUSD and USDL, like they're different tools. They do different things, right? So use the right tool. If um, you know, funding Jim is a big fan of, uh, um, the, the trust token and the trust dollar. Well, if you're using trust and that's how you're on and off ramping, that token makes more sense now. Right. So 
again, you want to use the right tool. All of these things have a place to some degree. And even things that have admin keys or counterparty risk. We all, I mean, again, crypto is one of the only places where we can do things with almost no counterparty risk. But almost everything else we do in life has counterparty risk. And we still perform all those other things, right? So even things like counterparty risk or admin keys or any of these, they make sense with the right risk profile, the right upside. So if I, again, if I want to go around and buy things here in the US, I have to use dollars, right? It's like, that's that's not objectionable. Like I don't have that option, right? But I can minimize how much my exposure is to inflation with all these other instruments and tools. And it's the same thing in crypto. We don't we don't want to get too myopic and say, even again, even if you follow my stuff and think that LUC is the greatest thing ever, like there's a reason, there's a place and time to use DAI. DAI gives me an ARB opportunity. Like, well, this happened. I'm a fan of DAI now. If I have to off ramp through USDC, if I have to be able to move huge, huge sums, there's all these different metrics where these things make sense. And you just use the right tool for the right job. Yeah, and so we, to, to follow on that, um, exactly right. So only on board, off board. That's where I talk about those things that are have property rights as escrow and TUSD is just an example. Um, as far as that existing since 2017. But that doesn't mean that in the DeFi space that that's the best opportunity when it comes to pools. Doesn't mean that it's the best opportunity when it comes to someone that's actively trying to trade or something like that. Most of what I care about, uh, especially since learning about uh, HEX and all these other things are, you know, our uh, HEX on HEX return, PLS on X on PLS X return, you know, that kind of thing, right? Because that's the speculation of this game in cryptocurrency, uh, the use case and things like that. But uh, it doesn't like like uh, Walrus was saying, you know, even though these things may be considered, here's a stable coin, here's an on ramp tool, here's an off ramp tool, here's an ARB opportunity in stable coins playing against each other in volatile times. You know, it's it's your your belief reinforced by code is what I care about. Uh, die, uh, you know, people I saw in your comment section, they were saying something about they didn't understand why. Uh, not USDC and why die as far as uh, certain large addresses. Uh, same thing. I, I made the comment earlier. I think it's marketing and advertising. Yes, there was an ARP opportunity and it worked out wonderfully for a 24 hour turnaround as far as ROI uh, because of the repeg and, and things like that. But I think something like 60% of die is not uh, Ethereum, that it is other things, right? So like there's, there's a part to me about does this push forward the narrative about a uh, single chain at this moment, Ethereum, Stablecoin, DeFi, you know, all the different tool sets that are available inside of the, the ecosystem that Ethereum allows with smart contract. And most of the narrative that I heard today, even though uh, a lot of them were Bitcoin people, every time that I heard them say something, it would be... Um, you know, the way that they wanted to generate their yield was by basically going into legacy markets, by going into uh, buying corporate equity on a platform that might facilitate cryptocurrency or might facilitate uh, uh, ROI on Bitcoin right itself. That's what Simon promotes all the time. And he even highlighted that his losses uh, over the past year of turbulence in cryptocurrency have been because of legacy investments, because he didn't get his Bitcoin back from Celsius, things like that. But uh, his DeFi plays, and you won't comment on what DeFi plays they are, but his DeFi contracts in, in the most likely the Ethereum network uh, is playing out a lot better than the opportunities available to Bitcoin because they don't have those smart contract options. They don't have that on-chain, uh, you know, stable position or peg uh, uh, opportunity. So I am ridiculously bullish about uh, Ethereum and the tool sets that they have developed and more so on pulse chain when it comes to the forking of a lot of these smart contracts that already have been battle tested you know boris talked about lusd or usdl or you know maybe there's other uh things that are going to use uh forks of the the liquidity code that's really really amazing that you know it it, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up about like what the opportunities will be over the next few years yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's something I want to get into a little bit uh, later too. Is just their options for stables and pulse chain. A lot of people have been asking about that. Uh, but just to, uh, to wrap up on arbitrage and the the stable coin usage and stuff. Uh, I know Walrus, you mentioned that you might have uh, seen some 
some leverage plays or, or other other opportunities this past weekend. Did you want to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So everybody calm down. I'm about to talk about leverage trading. So this is something where context is important. And a lot of times I actually use B Roots as an example of this because even though people get into it B Roots, I actually like B Roots. He's a pretty cool guy when you talk to him privately. Um B Roots will say, hey, XYZ token is going to go up and do something crazy, right? And those of us from Hex specifically tend to be like one band, one sound, and they're very, very heavy in, into different things, uh, whatever it is they're into. Sometimes they're Hex only, right? So when they hear someone say, hey, this token is going to go up, for them, it's they're shooting with a sniper rifle and he's shooting with a shotgun. So he's talking about tons of tokens. So when he says X, Y thing is going to go up, He's betting on 15, hoping that one goes up 100. That's the way that 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 idea works on this like meme coin valuation. But if you come from our school of thought of a lot of our community, someone says, hey, this thing is going to moon and they move all their stack into it and then get wrecked. And then they're like, B Roots is an idiot. And it's like, well, B Roots has done very well in the community. But you have to understand thesis when we're talking to each other. So a big example that this weekend that I wanted to bring up where some people were like, hey, there's this an ARB event. They saw the the wallets did it for a particular reason but if you look at a lot of more legacy minded people there's something that makes that this is important so people asked did i think the peg was going to regain i said yes they said oh so should i buy usdc and i said no part of that is because if you have to ask me you don't understand the risk don't do dumb stuff the other is you're essentially risking a huge amount or all of your principal for the peg regain which at most was 11 percent Pennies in front of freight trains, right? This much. Okay. Someone who's more legacy and does leverage looks at this trade very, very differently. So a legacy trader is going to probably put leverage, risking less principal, more upside, and probably have a stop loss where they can say, okay, as soon as this thing hits a point, I'm wrong on the trade. I'm going to take the loss, whatever that percentage is. They're exposed less principal. And they also say they were 5X. Well, they have a 50% gain versus 100 but their downside is still maybe they get liquidated and lose zero. But because of because of the the leverage, they're risking less or risking the same with more upside, regardless of how they play this. So that's a really good example where you have to like understand more of these contexts on these things. So again, so if you asked me, is that going to make sense? I would have said, yeah, of course, it's probably going to repeg for a lot of reasons that we get into the legacy side. But it's a bad trade because what's 10% in crypto? If you just sat in hex, you'd have done better off. So if you had tried to get cute as a, like a hexagon, you'd have been wrong. Even if you had made the play, you would have risked principal, picked up percent and made less money. So this is one of those things where we can talk about like sophistication and literacy. And there's a, a way to make that make sense. And then there's a way to be risking way too much principal. And for most of us, that's the reason that we went through this. So I think this is kind of a good learning experience of seeing how you could be right in the thesis, very wrong in how you played it, uh, especially if you're a hexagon, because then you could see how the R didn't overtake what you would have made just holding it. And so I think there's a lot to kind of learn from that idea there. So one, this is a rare example where leverage trading would have made sense, but in general, Spike just nailed it. Like, don't get cute. Like, don't be silly. Like don't risk huge amounts of principle for the idea that you're going to get a bunch of back pats and say, Ooh, look, I caught the ARB event, how smart I was and stayed strong for you. No one cares, man. You picked up 10% and risked your stack. Like, even if you were right, that was a bad play. To, to comment again about uh, the die play, uh, if you bet on USDC repegging, you were all in on Circle and you know CBDC and the narrative that banks control what a USDC is or the admin key of a crypto. Whereas on DAI, you're betting on uh, some percentage of that for sure, because part of it is multi-asset and part of it is is significantly is USDC. So part of it is the same narrative of risk. But the other side of it is you got ETH bros. You got ETH bros that started out with a single asset die product that has gained some stablecoin Lindy effect uh, over the past few years. And you're kind of hedging if you're going to be in one of those uh uh, properties, uh, one of those as a, as a quote unquote stable coin. And then when it goes to the other thing, uh, I think uh, maybe I'm, I'm probably not current on what liquidity is available. I know that Jesse, uh, Ask Jesse highlights often the liquidity um, 
uh, uh, value as far as market cap or what is available there. And I'm sure that uh, Walrus, maybe if he hasn't already commented, could say that as well. Uh, and, and whether or not it loses its peg, whether or not it breaks peg because of the value of Ethereum. So during the day, I think earlier in the morning today, when the streams were starting with Mario's channel, maybe I checked and Ethereum was around 14, high 1400s or something. And then later in the day, it was in the mid to high 1600s. I don't know where it's at now. Um, but you started to see a little bit of the, the echoing from the crypto people saying it's it, it, this, you know, the Fed has to respond by not, uh, you know, increasing interest rates. You know, they said that they're going to turn it up until it breaks, you know, that kind of narrative. And now they've broken something. Right. And then you see some of the politics, uh, you know, starting to try to push narratives during the day, squat box and things like that, making commentary about, you know, what percentage of, uh, you know, deposit holders or businesses, uh, you know, uh, gave to one party versus another, like, you know, a four X on Democrat versus Republican kind of party contribution. So you start to see the politics play out on two things. One is, is this, uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street? Is this 2008 uh, happening and, and banks are getting uh, bailed out as uh, crony capitalism? Or is this, uh, you know, still the people speaking through Reddit and through cryptocurrency that somehow, uh, you know, still push the the perception of price. So yeah, it was it was today. It was really really interesting. Yesterday was great too, and I'm I'm, uh, I'm curious what's going to happen over the next uh, three to four days uh, as this plays out even further. There we are there's some definitely movies, be, documentaries. Go ahead. Yeah, there there's definitely a lot, a lot of like just individual things that you can really expand on. So. Like for the idea on like FDIC and backing depositors, there's there's a natural idea of like we want to make people whole and those things make sense. But economies isn't this like I said this uh, responding to Gammon. I, th I think I think Gary, I think you liked it. Like the economy doesn't exist in this world where there's a bunch of levers where you can just pull and one thing happens at a time. Like we can see this through a ton of things in the current economy. So you want everyone to go to school. So you give access to huge amounts of funding to every student. And what happens to the price of college? goes to the roof because you just broke the you broke the pricing controls right so it just it breaks right you have health care and now you try to get everything where it's insured and now there's a huge spike and so you you break incentives like that's not you i don't get too meta here but so people can like if they're not that financially like astute you break reality like you start to actually change things where like there's an actual cost of something and an actual um benefit and if you start to add all these things, you start to change how those things really function. So the reason that Yale and any of these places didn't charge $80,000 a semester or whatever it cost, no one could have paid it. But if you make it where everyone can pay it, they have no reason to be competitive anymore because you broke the pricing control. So the same thing with healthcare and the same thing happens in banking. If you make everyone whole and no one ends up paying the price except for, you know, extraneously taxpayers, I have no reason to not be risky anymore. Oh, so if I break this thing, you guys pay for it. And if I hit and win, I get to keep the money. Cool. Shuffle up and deal. Now I go to, now I go back to the casino and I turn up leverage and I push every constraint that I can. And I get aggressive on what my collateral levels are and what my deposits are and how much is cash versus bonds and the length of bond. And I just get really aggressive because there's no downside for me anymore because you guys are going to come pick up the bill and you break the incentives to be reasonable. Right. And there's try to get out too much of rant. The other part about that is, is then you break competitiveness. So if RH and Gary want to actually play by the rules and be safe and do sound things, but I get to be super aggressive because I've got the fed backing me up or because X, Y, Z is going to bail me out or because I think there's going to be a bailout. If you want to go to either of them, you get a 3% return, but you get 7% from me because I'm dialed up full tilt with no resiliency and no way to bounce back from any of these events because I'm just trusting that I'm going to get backstop. So then they either lose because they're uncompetitive or now they have to turn up the game as well and be aggressive. And you can see this from all different kinds of game theory, but this, this small idea of, hey, we'll bail things out is much more than just we're going to make things whole. The, you break so many different parts of incentive models and controls if there's not there's not risk, right? If there was no risk in crypto, 
everybody would have every dollar they had here because it could go up a bunch, right? So if every time you caught a thousand X, you kept it, but every time you went to zero, you know, RH covers your bill. And, he, and I say, Hey, but I lost $5,000 a month trading this month. And he sends it to me and I just wheel and deal again. And I make 500 K and I never have to pay him back again. You just break things and it's, these things just don't happen in isolation. Like there's no isotopes in nature.